Hi, everybody. Welcome to this third session in our series on Christianity in India. Glad you are tuning in. Uh, in case you're wondering, this is the same presenter that you have had before, even with the shorter hair. I decided that in preparation for the Texas summer, I would uh, shed some of that hair and hopefully stay a little bit cooler. Um, if you saw last week, you know that we talked about the history of Christianity in India through a number of centuries. We looked at Catholics, Protestants, and Pentecostals, and we focused especially on missionary work, and we had a little snapshot of what those church bodies are like um, today um, in India, where there are between 40 and 45 million um, Christians in the country, even though it's a little bit hard to get definite numbers. Today, our focus is on caste and Dalits and Dalit theology. Um, I have touched on some of these things in previous sessions, but we haven't um, really drawn them out or gone into much depth. So today I'll go a little bit deeper into that. Just to get us into Dalit theology and to remind us that when we talk about Dalit theology, we're not just talking about um, academic heady things that only are connected with books, um, but we're talking about real people. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about how Dalit theology became real to me. In 2012, I was part of a group of 19 Minnesota Lutherans who went to India as part of our companion synod relationship. And one of the nights that we were there, we were hosted by a wonderful couple, Sunil and Grace Banu, in their home in Guntur. Sunil was serving as bishop at the time, and he talked about how caste is still a reality in India, especially in village settings. And he told us about how one of the most ancient scriptures of Hinduism, um, this one is called the Rig Veda, how the Rig Veda offers a creation story that tells about where humanity and the castes come from. According to this sacred text, the four castes come from the cosmic man, who was sort of like the raw material for humanity. And as the, the story goes, um, from the head came the Brahmins or the priests, from the shoulders came the Kshatriyas or the warrior class, from the thighs came the Vaishyas um, who were the merchants or the business class, and from the feet way down on the bottom are the Shudras or the servant caste. But actually not all Indian people are included in this story. There are also millions of people who are outcasts or untouchables, and they're simply not mentioned in this story. These are the Dalits. And I should also mention here that this story doesn't include the tribal people or Adivasis, but that's kind of another story. So Sunil told us how for him and many other Indians, the creation story in the book of Genesis, the creation story of Jews and Christians offers a powerful alternative, especially for Dalits, in this story, God creates all people, and the people are not divided into castes. Further, Genesis tells us that all people are created in the image of God, and thus they have received a dignity and value and worth that cannot be taken away from them. For Sunil and other Dalits, this was and is an incredible gift, and it's one of the attractions of Christianity. Sunil's story left an impression on me I would say that it's one of the reasons why I'm interested in Dalit theology. So I'm going to go into a little bit more depth and I'll pull up a couple of graphics so that we can um, have those to support our conversation. So here is a slide that um, goes with what I just described with the four casts, and I'll, I'll say a little bit about it, more about it in the next couple of minutes. So no one knows for certain where caste comes from, but it is certainly ancient, and there are lots of theories that try to explain it. Some people say that caste comes from a division between the lighter-skinned Aryans, who were from the north, and the darker-skinned Dravidians, the people of the south, in this explanation, the Aryans were either outsiders who came from Central Asia, perhaps, um, and they came in and oppressed the darker indigenous people um, who became the Dalits. Or in another version of the story, the Aryans were indigenous Indian people, um, but they still came to dominate other darker skinned um, 
Dravidian people who were from, as I said, the southern part of India. Other scholars argue that caste is really about purity and pollution. So according to th this theory, caste developed as a way to separate pure groups and pure occupations from impure groups and impure jobs. Um, I don't have a strong opinion. This is not really my field of, of expertise. As I mentioned before in, in the previous week, the caste system looks different in different places throughout history and throughout the vast land area and cultures of India. Our Western concept of caste actually combines a couple of different concepts. First, there is the concept of varna. This is a word that literally means color, and it includes <clears throat> the four divisions that I referred to with Sunil's story. So in this story, as you can see, the Brahmins are on top, followed by the Kshatriyas, Vaisyas, and Shudras. And interestingly, and perhaps not surprisingly, um, the specific Varnas or colors go from light to dark, um, which corresponds, of course, with um, Western notions of racism uh, based on, on color schemes. But in addition to Varna, there is also the concept of Jati. That's a word that means birth. And jati is more complicated because there are thousands of different jatis who are defined by occupation and shared history. Some of these different jatis are simply separated by difference um, based on jobs, for instance, um, but they are also arranged um, in a vertical fashion. So you could say that jatis simply have a horizontal stretch. They're different, but they're also ranked from top to bottom. Traditionally, one married only within one's jati, and some people think that Dalits or outcast people are descendants of those who were born as a mixture from so-called impure relationships between different jatis or varnas. Our concept, our modern concept of caste tends to gloss over some of these details of, of jati and varna. The modern concept of caste was formed by Western scholars and others who came to India as they observed society and talked with Indians to try to understand how Indian society works. And not surprisingly, when the Westerners talked to Indians, they tended to talk to high caste Indians. So they usually got the high caste version of the story and that's not the only version of the story. So the modern understanding of caste, the kind of thing that we learn in, in social studies class does reflect some real dynamics, some real inequalities in India. Um, but caste itself, as we understand it today, is shaped both by outsiders looking in um, and by Indians as they have continued to form um, these concepts. So both outsiders are involved and, and insiders, so to speak. Within India, about 16% of the population can identify as Dalit or outcast. And that means around 200 million people. Um, it's interesting just to note as a sidebar that that number could be added to because there have been news stories about caste dynamics, caste inequalities continuing even among Indian American communities in the US. Um, I've read about this in the Silicon Valley of, of California. Even after they immigrate here, um, some of those caste ladders are still operative. So Dalits have been known by many different names, but in the past century or so, Dalit has become the self-designation of choice. Dalit is, is a suggestive word. It literally means crushed, split, broken, torn asunder. And it's interesting that it became popular in part because it was used by a group in India called the Dalit Panthers, who were influenced, as you might expect, by the Black Panthers in the US. Dalits are not the same. They include lots of different jatis, lots of different occupations, um, lots of different social economic levels. Some of them have earned economic stability and advanced formal education and jobs with influence. There's a Dalit political party that has had um, success and power in, the, in India's most populous state, Uttar Pradesh. And caste dynamics also seem to be changing to some extent with younger generations and to some extent with the movement to cities where it's much harder to know what somebody's caste is. But even so, um, many Dalits face serious hardships. 
Many of them have um, forms of work like sanitation work with unsafe conditions and poor compensation. Dalit women face um, a horrible number of um, cases of sexual violence. When Dalits have tried to seek protection from the police or through the court system, um, police have too often dismissed or just shrugged at Dalit concerns. And in some cases, townspeople in India have taken justice, their injustice rather, into their own hands. Um, there are stories about upper caste Indians forcing Dalits to drink human feces drink uh, mixed with water. One of the biggest challenges has to do with what Indians call reservation status and what North Americans would call basically affirmative action. By law, Dalits are supposed to be given special opportunities in education and employment, but these opportunities are not available for Dalits who are Christians or Muslims. The argument for this is that one, once a Dalit becomes Christian or Muslim, they now exist in a caste-free environment, so they no longer need any protections. But based on what I've read, this is simply not true. And many Dalit activists would say that Christians and Muslims are excluded because Hindus want to discipline so-called foreign religions and discourage conversion and, pre and pressure um, Dalits who are Muslim and Christian to return to Hinduism. And sadly, but perhaps not surprisingly, Dalits also face marginaliz marginalization in the church. Even though perhaps two thirds of India's Christians are Dalits, they are not represented proportionally in leadership. They have been forced to enter church buildings by a separate door. They've had to receive communion after upper caste Christians so that their lips don't, uh, so that the Dalit lips, for instance, don't pollute the cup for the upper castes. And Dalits have sometimes been buried in a separate part of Christian cemeteries. Now, these are not always the case, this kind of Dalit discrimination in the church, but there are enough cases to um, take it quite seriously. And these are not just ancient history, but they're even, even in the last years. So all of this contributes to the rise of um, Dalit theology. Dalit theology, we can say, comes out of a social history like the one that I've just described, um, but it also comes out of a theological history. That is a way about talking about faith in, in India. So just to rephrase that, we can say Dalit theology first wants to protest and help fix the social realities and problems that I've named. And second, it wants to offer a new way about, a new way of talking about God and talking about the church and the Christian life in India. Let me just, just, give, just give a little bit of a history of theology in India. As we've learned in the last few sessions, from the very beginning, Christianity in India was a mixture of both Western forms of life and Indian forms of life. But for a long time, it was the Western forms that dominated. So this is a little bit of an oversimplification, but we can say that in general terms, until the 1800s, Christianity in India was mostly in the image of European and American missionaries. Church buildings, Christian worship, and church teachings were imported from the West and kind of plunked down in India. Now, there were definitely exceptions to this rule. Um, we have instances like Roberto de Nobili, whom I talked about before, who tried to teach Christianity by translating it into high caste Hindu thought. But even here, de Nobili, um, a foreigner, was the one in charge of the process of enculturation. But in the 1800s, this begins to change as Indians begin to adapt Christianity into Indian forms for themselves. Indian Christians and even some Indian non-Christians who appreciate parts of Christianity they begin to say, we don't need foreigners to tell us who Jesus is. We can describe him in our own terms, in our own languages, with our own distinctive ways of thinking. And interestingly, this movement with Indians um, appreciating Jesus and expressing Jesus in their own terms, this movement goes along with Indian nationalism, as Indians were forming a sense of national unity, national consciousness, national pride. And they were saying, we don't just want to be like foreigners, even though there are things about the West that we appreciate, but we want to be ourselves. 
So a representative of this is Ram Mohan Roy. He's the, in this slide, he's in the upper left in the painting with the hat on. He was born in the late 1700s, uh, a really remarkable thinker. So in the 1800s and 1900s, and still today, many Indians have brought together Jesus with Hindu philosophy and religion, and especially the high caste versions of Hindu philosophy and religion. Thus, they've spoken of Jesus as a guru or a spiritual teacher. They've spoken about the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, by comparing it to three Sanskrit philosophical words, sat, chit, and ananda, um, truth, consciousness, and bliss. And they've developed worship services that blend Hindu music and rituals with Christian teachings. Another representative of this is Raimundo Panikar, and he's in the upper right, uh, the white hair, the glasses, the green, um, the green cloth around his shoulders. He's an interesting scholar who died pretty recently. Um, one parent was Spanish Catholic, the other parent was Indian Hindu, um, and, and he has written some fascinating things that blend the two traditions. So we can say that all of this um, that I'm describing, describing, that is articulating Christianity through Hindu philosophy and religion, that's part of the enculturation that we've talked about before. And it's especially significant because this is enculturation driven by Indians themselves, not by foreign missionaries. So this is the backdrop, the theological backdrop, for the development of, Hindu, of Dalit theology beginning in the 1980s. In 1981, a seminary professor in southern India, in the city of Bangalore, um, a man named Arvind Nirmal gave an address that paved the way for the Dalit theology movement. Nirmal and the other early Dalit theologians emphasized several themes. First, they sharply criticized what they called the Brahmanization or the Sanskritization of Indian Christianity. By this, they meant that Indian, Indian Christianity still reflected the caste structure of Hinduism. It still had an emphasis on high caste ways of thinking. In a way, Dalit theologians were saying, it's not enough to say that Christianity has to become Indian. The more important thing is, what kind of Indian should Christianity reflect? The India of the oppressors or the India of the oppressed? And Dalit theologians want to say that Indian Christianity should express the oppressed Indians' experience and point of view. Second, Dalit theology wants to address social, economic, and political injustice. Dalit theology doesn't want a Christianity that makes a big split between heaven and earth. It doesn't want a Christianity that is focused primarily on spiritual issues. It wants a Christianity that makes a concrete difference in the welfare and suffering and flourishing in this life. So in this way, Dalit theology was like other expressions of theology coming from places in the world um, like Latin America, where poor Christians were also raising their voices, uh, beginning especially in the 1960s. This is something that we can talk more about in the Zoom call. Third, Dalit theology wanted to, to be distinctively Indian. So even though Dalit theologians appreciated the theological approaches, for instance, of poor people in Latin America and of black people in North America, Dalits wanted to highlight their own unique Dalit experiences. So here, this theology emphasizes that caste is not the same as class or race, even though there are some similarities. Nirmal wrote passionately about the suffering that comes from caste. For instance, caste suffering is not only about financial poverty, but about the shame and contempt that Dalits have faced. So Nirmal wrote about how in the past, if a Dalit person tried to learn Sanskrit, the language of the Brahmins, then Brahmins and other high castes would sometimes pour molten lead down the throats of the Dalits. And Dalit women were forced to go about topless so that higher castes could leer at their nakedness. Some Dalits were forced to have a broom tied around their body to trail after them 
and wipe away their footsteps so that higher castes wouldn't be polluted by them. All of this led Dalit theology to emphasize certain parts of scripture. Nirmal, for instance, highlighted the Messiah as the suffering servant, as the book of Isaiah talks about. Nirmal said that Jesus was a Dalit. Jesus was a uh, dobi or uh, a bungi. Those are Indian words that refer to um, poor people and their occupations in cleaning toilets and doing laundry. But Nirmal also lifted up passages like the Exodus, where God brought his people out of slavery. And this points to the hope that Nirmal had for the Dalits and for the hope that Nirmal believes Christianity could bring for the Dalits. So Dalit theology, like all theology, has evolved and changed. And Dalit theology has been around for about 40 years, and it's now in what we can call perhaps its second generation. I don't have time to go into a ton of details, but I'll offer a few examples. First, some theologians have tried to incorporate traditional Dalit life and customs into Christian theology. And the two theologians on the bottom, Satya Nathan Clark on the left in the suit coat, and Joshua Samuel on the right in, this, uh, in the striped shirt are examples of this. So these theologians argue that Dalit customs are not just pagan rituals that need to be eliminated from Indian Christianity, but actually Dalit um, culture is a positive resource that can reflect God's goodness and it can even teach the global church something about who Jesus is. For instance, some Dalits are drummers. Here's a picture of a Dalit drum from a record label. Um, and these drums are part of the reason why Dalits are considered to be unclean, because drums are made from animal skin and, and, and that's associated with death and blood. And also the drum music is used especially for funeral services. And once again, funerals are obviously associated with death and are thus unclean. Um, so Dalits who drum for funerals are doubly unclean. So Satya Nathan Clark, um, pictured there, um, is one theologian who proposes the idea of Christ as drum. Here Christ is not limited to a sacred written scripture, written in a language that only some people know, but this is a way of, of imagining that Christ is a common object made of flesh, even offensive flesh, um, Christ the drum is someone whose voice sounds out loudly and clearly as a drum. Um, you can check out a YouTube video in the handout document that shows some Dalit drummers. Um, so second generation Dalit theologians have also pushed back and sort of made complex some of the ideas of Dalit theology. For instance, Joshua Samuel in the bottom right um, a younger theologian, um, has pushed against the idea of a clear binary between oppressor and oppressed. And what he's saying really is that injustice is not as simple as saying high caste equals always bad and low caste equals always good. Because of course, Dalit men sometimes oppress Dalit women and Dalit peoples can sometimes be unjust towards Indian tribal people. Um, so the currents of oppression go back and forth and Dalit the theology is trying to reflect that. Third, Dalit theology has questioned the idea of a permanent, fixed, definite Dalit identity. So theologians thinking in this way are worried about a focus on Dalit theology that is so narrow that it excludes concern for other people. Instead, these theologians are trying to build partnerships with anyone who is oppressed, even if they're not called a Dalit. So in this way, Dalit can grow to mean not a specific um, group that is defined strictly by blood, for instance, or DNA or something, but Dalit um, can refer to anybody who is facing injustice. Fourth, some Dalit theologians have pushed Dalit theology beyond what they call Christian centrism. Um, this is because in India, Dalits are Christians, Hindus, and Muslims. So if Dalit life is to be improved, it needs 
to happen not just for Christians, but for everyone. Finally, some Dalit theologians are recognizing the danger of Dalit theology that becomes too heady, too stuck in the academy, too disconnected from everyday Dalit life. In some ways, Dalit theology has become an accepted part of seminaries and universities, but there's always a danger in this. When movements become institutionalized, they can become stagnant. So some Dalit theologians are asking how Dalit theology can better serve actual Dalit lives. They're asking why Dalit theology hasn't been embraced by the people as much as they would like. And they're asking what it would take, what it will take to bring actual concrete liberation and flourishing to Dalits. This is an important point um, for all theology. And I hope it's something that we can talk about when we come together. There's lots more we could say, but I'll leave it at that for now. And um, I'll invite you again to the Zoom conversation on Monday night at 7.30. I think that's the 17th. Um, know that you are welcome to come to that Zoom conversation, even if you haven't been part of previous Zoom calls. Uh, I look forward to that time. God's blessings to you all. Bye.